Welcome to the New Ventures podcast. My name is Sanjoy Sanyal, and I'm the founder of Regain Paradise, a boutique clean tech consulting firm, and a visiting fellow at the Cambridge Judd Business School. Our guest for today is Robin McGuckin, the Director of Partnerships at P4G. Welcome, Robin. Hi, Sanjoy. It's great to be here. Robin, there's a double happiness in me to host you. You are a WRI colleague for many years. But also, one of the things I really want to get down in by talking to you is lessons on how public money can be used to promote innovation and entrepreneurship. This is a question that bothers a lot of people who are in charge of public financing for climate change. So this is going to be a really interesting conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, really looking forward to that. And that is something P4G has given a lot of thought to. So I'm very keen to dive in and see where this takes us. Right. And for our audience who do not know what P4G is, I'll just put in a one-line definition. P4G is a global platform accelerating, pioneering green partnerships with catalytic financing. Why are partnerships so important for innovation? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great one-line definition of P4G. And the reason why partnerships are so important for innovation is that particularly in low and middle income countries where P4G focuses, new businesses, new startup ideas, uh, new business models face a double challenge in that they are trying to do something innovative in the green marketplace, which is relatively new, globally speaking. And they are also trying to do this in a low and middle income economy where it is more difficult to attract financing. Therefore, what we do is we bring in multiple stakeholders, multiple partners, including government, commercial partners, and non-commercial partners to work together on both the commercial aspect of the business to bring that up to an investment-worthy prospect, as well as working with government to ensure that prospective investors in that business model understand that there is alignment with government policy, that there is government buy-in to that business concept, that business model, and to bring that extra level of confidence and comfort that even the more risk-prone investors like impact investors and development finance institutes need in order to have that level of comfort to provide that investment. Great. So you bring in multiple partners to ensure project success. That's one part. You enable financing by focusing on bringing in financial partners, including impact investors and international development financial institutions. But you also get in government to sort of mainstream this and also in some ways de-risk it by making sure that the project aligns with the government's policy regime. That's kind of the takeaway I'm hearing from you. That's correct. And in the impact investing and accelerator space, this is what we feel is a really unique value add of P4G is that in each of our partner countries, we have established what we call our national platform, which is in itself a partnership. Each of our national platforms consists of a key government agency usually the Ministry of Finance or Treasury, and also the Ministry of Environment or whichever ministry is charged with accomplishing the NDCs for climate change. And then that government entity works alongside the leading national industry association for that country. And together, they work with our partnerships to bring that level of confidence to investors and also for our partnerships to be able to have a leg up, a bit of an advantage as they get out with their business concept and start testing it and particularly testing it in the public policy space where we are looking to work with our partner governments on advancing public policy for the global green growth goals. Great. One of the things, obviously, that you do to foster partnerships, which entrepreneurs always like, is you provide catalytic funding. So maybe you can start by explaining a little bit of what you do and how it helps. Absolutely. 
Yeah, so our catalytic funding comes in the form of non-returnable grants, which essentially our partnerships use as early stage seed funding to cover the expenses of feasibility and very importantly, operationalizing their business concept. Our typical grant size is between 100 to 400,000. We provide grants of up to a million. We've found that our most successful partnerships have grants in around the 500,000 range. More valuable than our funding though, are the acceleration services we provide, or, or we feel that it's actually more valuable. Those, that funding is critical as seed funding, but the acceleration services are what we feel really helps our business models, our partners to have that edge to advance towards success. So in addition to funding, we also provide advice on operationalizing, including early stage advice on building out a business plan, financial model, and other materials needed to get in front of investors. Now, most of our partnerships come with a business plan and financial pro formas. We help them refine that, fill in gaps, and then very importantly, get in front of key investors with whom we work that are willing to come in to this earlier investment space, or what we often call the missing middle, where it's so difficult for innovators to attract financing. We also provide a network for our partnerships through the P4G Partners and Network, which includes organizations such as the World Economic Forum, the Global Green Growth Institute, and other leading international players. We're able to provide a global stage for our partnerships to bring their ideas into the mainstream and find additional champions and supporters. We regularly have partnership workshops at global events such as COP, the the various COPs, and also the UN General Assembly, the World Economic Forum events, and so on, to try to not only help our partnerships succeed, but also to inspire others in the marketplace based on those successes, because that's what we want to see is really a major shift in perspectives around what can comprise a successful business model in the global green growth space. Right. You know, you've covered a fairly large gamut of topics. You know, you provide catalytic funding, but you provide also acceleration services. I will get into each of these a little bit in detail as we talk, but maybe just to help us orient, you focus around broad green topic and NDCs, and you have talked about this, but specifically, what are the sectors that you focus on? Yeah, great question. We focus on five of the sustainable development goals. We focus on the SDG two around food and sustainable agriculture. We focus also on SDG six around particularly water and sanitation. SDG six is the WASH metrics, but we focus on water and sanitation. And very importantly, SDG seven, which is for clean energy access, SDG 11 for sustainable cities, and SDG 12 for circular economy. And what we have developed over the past four years is based on our partner countries' interests. We work across these four, five areas in four key thematic areas that we specialize in. And one is digital solutions for water. Another is energy transition broadly from conventional energy to clean energy. A third is zero waste economy focused particularly on plastics and textiles. And then fourth is sustainable agriculture and food loss and waste. Great. And one of the most interesting parts of our podcast will be when we talk about example partnerships in these Mm -hmm. areas. But, you know, before we get there, just again, make sure that we have our starting point all right. Yeah. You know, I know you distinguish between scale up and startup partnerships. Just help us get those definitions correct. Absolutely. Yeah, so our startup partnerships are typically trying an innovative new business model. What we ask our startups is that they are not pioneering a new technology. There's no technology research and development for P4G. We are not focused on technology research and development. 
we're focused on innovation in the business model around a proven commercially viable technology. And the support we provide to our startups can be as early stage as doing their feasibility studies and market testing. What we really prefer is to work with startup partnerships that have done their feasibility and market testing and are ready to operationalize. And then we can help them to operationalize. And then if that proves successful, we can help them to attract their true seed funding, as well as then their Series A financing. Our scale-up partnerships typically have already operationalized their business model, or they are taking a business model that has successfully been operationalized by another, and then bringing that model into a new region, a new country. So our scale-ups are more about replication and scale which is also a risky prospect because of course, going into a new marketplace with an existing product involves a considerable amount of risk. So we work with our scale-ups to de-risk and to operationalize in that new country or region, and then to bring in that series A round of investment or that new business line. And I'll say also, so far, we've funded 66 partnerships across our nine countries of implementation. Our countries of implementation are quite specific. They include in Asia, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Vietnam. In Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, and South Africa. And in Latin America, Mexico, and Colombia. And I should mention in Latin America, Chile is also a partner. They are a partner in inspiring us with new ideas to take to other countries. Very nice. Other innovation supporting organizations also fund scale up and startup, but they fund scale up and startup companies and entrepreneurs, right? But in your case, you fund partnerships. So just give us an example of, you know, a typical partnership. Is it a public private partnership? How can they approach you? And you know, what would be your process of selection? Absolutely. We have an open call for applications. It is always open and a partnership that thinks that they have an idea that's ready can come to our website at any point in time and complete a short concept note and attach their business plan and ideally their financial pro formas if they have them. And we evaluate all of those on a biannual basis. We have two deadlines each year that kick off for us an analysis process that then goes through to a decision process for the actual funding and support. Our partnerships are typically comprised of three main entities, a commercial partner, and that commercial partner is the entity that is trying to you know, start up or scale up their business model. There is also a non-commercial partner, such as a NGO, a nonprofit organization or a civil society organization that often is helping to work on the policy side and or on the environmental and social benefit side where they're bringing that level of legitimacy and that rigorous methodology for quantifying and ensuring that the environmental and social benefit is there alongside that commercial bottom line impact. And then the third partner is of course government. And the government partner that we ask for is that entity that is most relevant to the partnership. So it may not be the P4G national platform because we bring that partner. It may be in fact a regulator of a sector or a provincial government entity or another government entity that's most closely related to that partnership idea. And I can provide some specific examples as we get into some of our partnership discussions on a sector by sector basis. Great, so partnerships, which include commercial, nonprofit, civil society organizations and the government come together. There is a call for applications. You review them twice a year. They fill up a concept note. You have some criteria. You know, I can well imagine what those criteria are. Those partnerships get selected. 
you provide them catalytic funding, which I'm sure the commercial organization really appreciates. But I, I recognize your point that you know, the services that you provide, non-fund based are also very important. And these are in five or six main areas of green. That's the focus and then in, let's just dive right in. And one thing I wanted to ask you is that you define the sweet spot of catalytic funding is at about $500,000. I suppose that number would change, right, for scale-up and startup. Yes. And in fact, what we've seen with our scale-up partnerships is that sometimes they've needed a second round of funding. So we've had sort of two different journeys, as it were, for our partnerships. We have some partnerships that have started out at a startup level with P4G, and then as they have successfully operationalized, we have advanced with them into the scale up where they're looking to replicate and advance the model even further. And we can provide an additional round of funding for that. We also have partnerships that have started at a scale up and have made significant progress. But as you can well imagine, many of these projects take quite a while to move through both the regulatory and commercial processes and prove out. And so we have found it advantageous to do another round of funding to help them to continue to advance that really promising progress that they've made with the first round of funding. So we have eight partnerships of our 66, we have eight partnerships that have received a second round of funding to enable that further work. Very interesting because I've been involved in with, in similar projects. And it's not a, often a given that people understand this transition and, and the need for continued support, which means that the donors who support you must be also very flexible and sort of you know, open-minded about this. It's, a, I guess, the time in our podcast technology, their role. That's right. Yeah. So we have three funders, the government of Denmark, the government of the Netherlands, and the government of South Korea. With each one of our funders, we are funded through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we work with these funders as part of our board and they form an executive committee. And we work with them throughout our own selection process to help them understand the partnerships that are coming through, to help them understand the specific level of funding needed and the level of support needed, acceleration support needed. Furthermore, we have very rigorous monitoring and evaluation criteria, and across our 66 partnerships over the past four, nearly five years, as you can well imagine, we've gathered a lot of data based on our monitoring and evaluation, and we conduct lessons learned every six months, and we formalize that on an annual basis, and we discuss that with our funders through our executive committee and adapt our P4G processes and systems accordingly. So it is really a very dynamic process. It is very robust and it's wonderful because we're able to learn and grow as we go along rather than being set in a, you know, a fixed model. So it's, it's been a very exciting process and one I'm really looking forward to, to continuing. For other people trying to understand lessons from P for G, I think this last thing that you said is really critical, not to have a set process, but to evaluate and learn and then change the process. But in supporting entrepreneurship, you know, that is really, really critical. Absolutely. And I think it is particularly critical in this space because I'd say as a global community, we know quite a lot about what it takes to support Support entrepreneurs, but in this unique space in which we're working with low and middle income countries, we call this the missing middle because it is particularly challenging for entrepreneurs in these countries to attract investment, just as it has proven to be particularly challenging for entrepreneurs in the green space, such as early stage renewable energy development and, and other sectors we're very familiar with to attract funding. And so, so what we see within P4G is we're actually one of a very few number of players, a very few number of accelerators working specifically at the intersection of these two difficult sectors. And 
So we really are learning and we believe that we're along with other accelerators working in this space, really paving new ground. And so the ability to be flexible and to learn in this climate, in this context is absolutely critical to not only the success of our partnerships, but of course, the success of P4G. And hopefully what we want to see is the success of a growing number of accelerators working on addressing this missing middle. Well, let's go back to the beginning of the podcast. One of the things that you said, which is that the catalytic funding financing is, is one part, but the services that you provide are the other part. And that is obviously an important point because one worry that any grant provider has is that the business never scales up mm -hmm. post the grant phase, right? So is this possibly the time where you should talk a little bit about those investor sessions that you do? Yes, yes. I can definitely talk about the investor sessions that we do. They are investor sessions are very specifically structured to our partnerships and our partnerships needs. Because what we have found at P4G is that each one of our partnerships is quite unique because they're looking at a financial mechanism at a business model that typically has not been tried before. So we work very hard with our partnerships to make sure that the business plan and financial model is as clear as possible and that we have worked together to create a pitch deck for investors that really gets to the heart of the matter in a very clear and succinct manner as quickly as possible and because investors have limited attention span. And then we bring to these investor sessions not only our partners, but also, as I mentioned earlier, some of these really important in-country stakeholders from government from civil society and even from the broader um, industry community to come in and you know, voice their support for this model. So for example, if we are, if we say hypothetically a session on investing in e-mobility, we would want to not only have our e-mobility companies have their very clear pitch decks and pro formas, we would typically bring in, uh, as long as we can, somebody from our national platform who speaks to the government buy-in to e-mobility and the government policy and regulatory changes that have taken place or are underway to further enable e-mobility. And then additionally, bringing in major auto manufacturers or automotive or bus or freight uh, vehicle sellers to talk about how they see the shift in this marketplace as an advantage for their businesses as well. So you really bring to both the partnership this level of legitimacy and to investors this level of comfort that this is an area that has the level of support needed to significantly decrease the risk of failure. Now, you know, and that's the nature of this, this business. We will always have ventures that do not succeed. And we recognize that in this space, we are going to have perhaps more ventures that do not succeed than say in a traditional venture capital uh, type of setup. But that's one of the reasons why we have such a high number of partnerships, 66 partnerships and still going um, because we're looking to try hard, hopefully succeed or fail quickly, and then learn and move on rapidly so that we can reiterate and try this again. Because one of the big principles of P4G is to act with urgency to accomplish the SDGs and to address climate change. Very important points. I'll just talk, pull out two of them. So one is recognizing that there'll be more failures. And this again goes back to what you started talking about which is the commitment of the donors, the ability yeah. to understand that specific grants will go nowhere, but the program will. And I think that's an important thing. The other thing I want to just quickly call out, and Robin, uh, you like this as well, is that WRI has a long history of supporting work where entrepreneurs try and raise capital. New Ventures, <laughs> which where I started with WRI, 
We was actually set up by Louis Ross, who is now in the Inter-American Development Bank. And he's founded that New Ventures in 2001. So, so this is a long history, with 20 years of history of supporting entrepreneurs raise capital. Yeah. Would it be nice to know a little bit about you know, some examples of where partnerships have really benefited from this? You know, for example, I've heard uh, the project that you supported around sustainable industrial clusters, they have benefited from this type of sessions? Yes, indeed. So these sessions have benefited a number of our partnerships, sustainable special economic zones, is one such where they have leveraged a significant, they realized a significant amount of investment and uh, actually were able to launch a new venture called Savo Project Developers that specialize in the development of sustainable industrial clusters. And so these are industrial zones where the prevalent number of businesses in that zone have sustainable products that they are producing, products or services. They also comply with the sustainable development goals for equitable workspaces with you know, learning, um, growth, uh, equitable salaries, et cetera. And they are working with government to enable these special economic zones to have the kind of economic incentives that will um, increase the, the number of businesses and the number of imports and exports that can happen of these products and services and therefore increase the viability of that zone. So we worked on a few specific zones um, starting in, in Nigeria and Kenya and um, have had real success with, with launching those, capitalizing them. And now Savo Project Developers is out with some very significant goals to expand the number of sustainable industrial clusters in the developing world uh, in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. So it's really exciting work. Africa Green Co. has also really benefited from our investor sessions. And more recently, um, we have a partnership called Green Invest, which is about a geothermal insurance mechanism and fund for expanding geothermal in East Africa, particularly looking at, in East Africa, there are a number of geothermal fields that are very well understood. There are a number of other geothermal fields that have high potential, but are not well understood. They haven't been explored as much. And that early exploratory work for geothermal can be quite risky because your chance of drilling down and hitting a dry well versus a wet well um, are, are significant. So this is a mechanism to help de-risk that investment in new geothermal areas in East Africa. So we have a number of really innovative partnerships that have benefited from our investor sessions. And as we increase our number of partnerships, we're, we're hoping to significantly increase that involvement and that kind of activity. And in our next episode, Robin will come back and talk a little bit about the most exciting partnerships her organization has supported and also the really pioneering partnerships whom other organizations should look up to. They're called state-of-the-art partnerships. So Robin, just give us a little pitch into why people should come back and listen to the second part of this podcast. Absolutely, Sanjoy. Yeah, I think that'll actually be really exciting because in that we dive into some of what we believe are the most innovative ideas out there in these sectors and some of the most successful ideas that we've seen in the past few years. So it'll be a really fun discussion to dive into and looking forward to that. And I hope your listeners are too. Absolutely. So in this podcast, we've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the type of partnerships Robin's organization supports, P4G. We've talked about the financing initiatives that P4G has supported, but the most exciting part comes in the next episode. So please tune in.